So I went to bed angry last night. <laughs> You're not supposed to do that. And um, several things on my mind and heart. And I woke up and I prayed about it. Lord, why? I was also angry and frustrated last night. It wasn't like a post-Christmas thing or anything, just in case you're judging me. (laughs) And God spoke really clear. Steve, it's because you're selfish and prideful. It's like, (laughs) that's really not the answer I wanted. I wanted to blame somebody else because it was their issue last night when I went to bed. And uh, no, Steve, you're selfish and prideful. As we come through Christmas time, it's time of giving and receiving, right? And how you responded to maybe things that you gave or you received was different, depending on who you are, maybe how old you are, maybe what you were hoping Santa was going to bring you. How many of you, I want to take a little survey, uh, here are your choices. You're a giver or you're a receiver. Which do you find more joy in? Okay, We will not judge you either way. You like to give or you like to receive? So givers, can you raise your left hand? Okay. And then receivers, all the honest people. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) Some of you are dual, you can't decide. And that's really true. I feel the same way. Depending on where I'm at, I love to receive, but I also love to give. Well, I have a gift I'd like to give this morning. I think I'm going to give it to Nathan. You don't have to open it till later. But you're the only one that remained in the front row, thankfully. Um, so I spent my hard-earned money on this. I had to go shopping, all the crowds and the stores, and that was a real drag. And it's money that I could have spent on other stuff, you know? Yeah. Stuff for me. And this is a gift that I would rather keep because I like gifts, but um, here you go, man. <laughs> you can have it. Just take it, okay? Right, there's a lot wrong with that, right? <laughs> yeah. How we give and the spirit in which we give is important. It's very key, right? And how we receive, too. And today we're going to talk about the gift of faith. And that might sound a little weird to you, the, the gift of faith. But when you think about faith and all the things that we put our faith in and our trust in, it's a real action point sometimes to say, I have faith that God is going to deliver. I have faith that God is going to come through and keep his promises. So it really is a gift or something that we give to God, even though we should always just trust him. I want to look at that gift today. And I want you to think about faith in maybe a different way. We're going to look at some really great scriptures. But how many of you got up this morning and you went to the light socket because it's dark in the morning now, and you're like, ooh, I hope it works. I hope it works. And then you flipped it on. Okay? None of you did that? No, because you always flip on and off light switches. I don't know what happens in that wall. I know Ken does and others, but I just flip it on and it works. I don't, it doesn't take a lot of faith for me to do that. How about the steering wheel when you were driving here today? Were any of you like, whoo, about to go left. I hope the car goes left, right? All freaked out about it? No, we do it every day. It's an act of faith to turn that wheel. You may not understand the pumps and all the fluids and all the things that go into that. But yeah, it's just a simple act of faith that we take for granted. How about some of you, maybe, you've tied this little cord around your leg and you jumped off a bridge. We call it bungee jumping. Has anybody ever done that? We had one in the first service. Okay. That's a little bit bigger act of faith, but putting all your faith in that one cord as you jump off a bridge and hope that you don't die, um, that's pretty amazing. So faith comes in different packages, different sizes, what's required of us. And this morning I want to show you a video, and I'm showing this, and I just want you to forget about everything else and just enjoy the smile on the boy's face, okay? It's called Walking Miracle, and this kid had a miracle happen in his life. And it's a music video too, but I just want you to enjoy his smile, okay? Three weeks old. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty little kid, but a lot of faith. I mean, he's pretty and he's young is what I meant to say. (laughs) With a lot of faith. Hey, there was a fisherman from Minnesota. This fisherman was very, very well prepared. He knew how to fish. 
read all the books, seen the videos. He had everything he needed to be a good fisherman. The poles, the nets, the bait, even a really nice boat. But this fisherman had a problem. He never, ever caught a fish. Not even once. Any ideas why? He never went fishing. He never got in the boat. He never left the dock. He never once caught a fish. He had faith maybe in all his supplies and what he had, but his faith did not lead to action, which would be get in that boat and get some fish. The Bible is really clear about how important faith is, and I've been on this faith journey because I'm a little schizo about it. I probably never heard that word in a sermon. Especially the last five years, I've been challenged to think, is my faith enough? What does that look like? How do I know if I have enough faith? Is it being lived out, acted out? And I kind of wrestle with God because God moves through our faith in big ways. So if I don't have enough or if I'm not in the right mind frame of faith, what does that look like? Now, we know God's sovereign. He's going to do what he does. We understand that. But my part in faith, as we'll see in these scriptures, is really important. So Hebrews 11.6, without faith it is impossible to please God. Let's talk about that one. I'll read that for you. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Powerful statement, right? Very powerful. So what does our faith look like? And I love the second part. Those who come to him must believe that he exists and he will reward those who seek him earnestly. Are we seeking God? Are we earnestly looking for him? Because I sure want the rewards of God. Let's flip over in that same chapter to verse 33. And this again is a real powerful scripture. Who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised to them. And Hebrews 11 is all about people of faith godly people of faith that saw amazing things like the waters part that they could walk through and other things. They quenched the flames of the fire and escaped the edge of the sword whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and defeated their enemies. Women received their dead back, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to release so they might gain an eternal resurrection. I did a memorial service for a friend this week. She's only 45. And the hope, the hope of heaven is so crucial to us, isn't it? And I think we don't understand what heaven's going to be like. We, we got the biblical picture, right? But there's so much more going on up there that's going to be just beautiful and amazing. And I think all these questions we have about why and things that don't make sense in heaven, I don't think they're going to matter anymore. It's going to be a place of beauty with no more pain and suffering. And if our good Father has gone to prepare that place for us, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be a beautiful place. So on my rough days, I, I look forward to heaven, and I know that that's going to make all things new and right. So some people face jeering and flogging, while others were still chained and they were put in prison. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and Goats, clothes, I guess, <laughs> destitute, persecuted, and they were mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in the desert, in the mountains, in the caves, in the holes in the ground. Yet, these were all commended for their faith in God. Yet, none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that we might together with us that we would be made perfect. You know, these people, they saw, again, amazing things that God had done. But they hadn't seen all the promises fulfilled. And the main one is Jesus. In the Old Testament, they were still looking forward to the Messiah, Jesus, a promise that they never saw. But looking back, we have the beauty of knowing about Jesus. Jesus and salvation, something they long for and look forward to. But these martyrs, these people that went through so much, the testing of their faith, they knew who they believed in and were confident that he would deliver them one way or the other. Ultimate healing is heaven, right? 
And we pray for people on this earth. We ask in faith. I just prayed for a brother outside. I said, God, in much faith that I can, I ask that you would heal this brother. I don't know what else to say. I believe God can. I know he can. And I had to leave it there with the Lord. Next is our faith without actions and works is dead. Doesn't sound like very good news. Let's turn to James 2, 15 through 23. That's another great passage. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but you don't do anything about their physical needs, what good is it? Can I get an amen? Yeah, people are looking for us to take action in the body of Christ, the church. Some say we wouldn't need any government programs if the church did what it was supposed to do. Someone said it, I'm not sure who. In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by its action, is dead. Faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Practice what you preach, all those other sayings we hear. You know, we have this faith, but if it's just up here and it's not lived out in action, people don't see it. People don't get it. They don't understand it. They call us hypocrites. My wife Sharon, her dad had a situation where he was in a crisis mode, and he asked a Christian to help, and the Christian said, sorry, I don't have time. I'm on my way to church. And that turned him sour for so many years. Thankfully, he got saved before he died. But he was mad at Christians almost the whole time I knew him. Because of one person that soured him that way. Let's continue reading. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. You foolish man, do you not want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Let's consider Abraham. He was considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see, his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. I am a friend of God. I don't know if that's where it comes from, but um, it could be. You see that a person is justified by what he does, not just by faith alone. I've been a Christian a long time, and so sometimes the Bible stories, they can get a little dry for me because I've heard them and I've taught them. But one thing I'm trying to do this year is put myself in the story, like I'm a live-action figure (laughs) in the story, okay? So can you imagine Abraham and Isaac walking up that mountain and Isaac asking, Dad, we got all this stuff, but there's no lamb, there's no sacrifice. And Abraham says to him, God will provide a lamb. And can you imagine being Isaac? You're on the altar now. There is no lamb, and your dad is above you with a knife, ready to plunge it into your heart. Can you imagine me and Abraham, how he felt? I mean, as a parent, you wouldn't even think of doing that. So he's there. I don't know how long he waited, but a ram in the thickets caught by its horns, and a new age of trusting the Lord is born. Abraham trusted God. And I believe that Abraham knew that God could raise him from the dead because God had made him a promise, a clear promise in Scripture for generations to come. But still the act of faith of lifting that knife to do that. What about David? That's a familiar story, right? Yes, he killed the lions, he killed the bears. But a giant, a giant who was tormenting the land, a giant who was undefeated, nobody could defeat him. Here's David, five stones. Is five enough? (laughs) One was enough, right? And I love the part of the story where David, his little sling, this little small guy, and he runs at Goliath. He runs at him. That's confidence. That's faith in God. And he hurls that stone, and that one little stone, which doesn't make sense to anybody, kills Goliath. Amazing. Faith in God, God using his obedience, his obedience to kill a giant. Has God ever prompted your mind or your heart to do something? And did you obey? 
was it a clear prompting of faith, something that maybe was difficult or hard, and you said yes to that prompting? I've said both. I've said yes, and I said, I think you got the wrong guy, Lord. I'm sure that message was for the house down there on the left. But God rewards us when we say yes, and he gives us everything we need, right? I really believe we miss the blessings of God because we don't say yes to more of those promptings of what God is asking us to do. Maybe it's giving money to somebody or talking to that guy that you think you should have talked to a long time ago at the grocery store or being nice to that person when they've only been rude to you, killing them with kindness. The Lemons family, this is written in my notes, I'm not picking on you. Um, I loved you all when I met you, but when I met the Levins family, there's something unique about them, and it was this faith that they had. If you don't know their story, uh, they're foster parents and family. Kids were all involved in that decision, too. And they took in foster kids, and sometimes very difficult ones, as well as teenagers. And for me, that would freak me out to bring a random teenager in my home, even though I love them and let them live there. But they made a decision in faith that they were going to be a foster family. And that's a huge decision. And you have to trust God with a decision like that. And then making the decision to adopt two of those wonderful kids and raise them, that takes a lot of faith. That's a huge commitment. And that's part of the reason why I connected with your family right away, because I saw what you were doing, and I was like, that's awesome. These people got to be all right. A little weird, but... They have a lot of faith (laughs) in moving forward. And you have done things like that, and I have done things like that. But for the Lemon family, that's a lifelong commitment of saying, God, trust you. I have faith that you will work this out. All right, our next passage is Matthew 17, 14 through 23. With faith, we can move a mountain. Anybody ever done that? you have come up and finished this sermon, that would be great. (laughs) When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on on my son. He has seizures. He's suffering greatly. He falls into the fire and into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Jesus said, oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, how long will I stay with you? How long will I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. Jesus never does a half healing or quarter healing. He always does it completely, right? Yeah. And here on earth, again, we pray in faith, and we ask, but we don't always get what we ask for. Maybe it's faith-related. But ultimate healing is heaven, right? And we live in a broken world. We live in a world that's very broken. And people, sinful people will hurt us. Sinful people will hurt each other. In this world, it is what it is until one day we're in glory. We have to put up with the sin and the hurt. But that shouldn't affect our faith because God is perfect and his love is perfect for us. All right, keep reading. The disciples came to Jesus in private, and they asked, why could we not drive out the demon? He replied, because you have so little faith. People were walking with Jesus, talking with him, seeing miracles. Jesus says, because you have so little faith. I tell you the truth. If you have faith, if of a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. When they came together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day, he will rise to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. There's a bigger picture here, yeah. This demon-possessed boy gets healed, but Jesus is preparing them. He said, you're going to need a lot of faith, because I'm going to get crucified. I'm going to die, and that's going to be hard, and people are going to be crazy about it. And then I'm going to rise again. I need you to have faith that this is going to happen. I need you to have faith that what I'm telling you is true. And as we know, the disciples struggled, but many of them had faith through this process of Jesus 
coming, dying on a cross, and being raised for our sins. Church, we need to have strong faith, don't we? What are we doing? You know, as a church, where's our faith at? And I know it's an individual thing, but as a church, does God want us to do more in this community? Does God want us to do more with our church? Does God want us to add fresh paint? Okay? What is God calling and asking us to do? The sign of a healthy church isn't necessarily that it's full. I mean, that could be part of it, especially not during COVID. But part of a healthy church is who we're discipling. And uh, Jill and I were talking this morning. The work of the church, it doesn't usually happen on Sunday mornings or potlucks. It's all outside these doors, people. But what happens outside these doors causes people to come and fellowship and be part of our body too. We heard Jesus say so many times in the gospel, your faith has healed you. Your belief in who I am, your faith, your belief has healed you. Other times we've had little faith and we blame God for what didn't happen, what didn't come about. Could it have been that our faith and our actions affected the outcome of what we asked God for? The answer is yes. <laughs> Definitely yes. Disciples, they tried to drive out the demon. Oh, ye of little faith. But God, I can't do this. I can't do that. I failed at this. I failed at that. I can't forgive. I can't believe this person. I can't, I can't, I can't. We serve a God of I can's. A God who gives us the strength and the faith to do whatever he asks us to do. So sometimes we've got to let those excuses go. We've got to move forward in faith for what God's asking us to do. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Our God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when it comes to our faith, and again, I've struggled with this, especially the last five years, of what it looks like to have real faith in God. And what I do is when I pray and there's a matter ahead of me, I just say, God, with all the faith I have in my heart, in my heart, in my mind, I pray and I ask you, believing with everything within me that you can and will do this. And just acknowledging from what I know about God that he's able to do all that I ask, more than I can imagine and think. And for me, it's just focusing myself to have that faith. But sometimes we have to step out of the boat, right? Like Peter did. God's calling us to action to step out. And again, I don't know what that is for you. I know things for me that I need to step out and trust God. Whether it's a baby step or the jump off the bridge with the bungee cord. Let's go! <laughs> I don't know. But the next step of faith is important. Well, we're on the backside of Christmas here. Have you thought about the birth of Jesus in that story? I know you all can quote it. Um, this year we had seven grandkids at our house. And it was complete chaos because they were all hyped up on sugar and brownies. And they were excited about the presents. So for about two hours it was like, ah! And But when we got to the part where we were going to do the story of Jesus, they all acted it out. We had shepherds and wise men. And it was really fun. Um, different, but fun. <laughs> But I got to thinking about how beautiful that story is. And there were some key things of faith in there I want to just share with you. Mary. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Mary, you're going to carry the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. You're going to carry that child to full term and raise him. Can you imagine what Mary was pondering and thinking? It says she's pondering. Of course she is, maybe a little stressed out. In that moment when she knew the child was conceived within her, what faith that took, right? Having one kid is enough, but to have the Son of God, to have that responsibility. Now, of course, Jesus wasn't going to rebel and do all those things, so that helped. <laughs> he wasn't going to have his two-year-old tantrums, I hope not. But... Mary pondered that. And then Joseph, when he heard the news as a father and that responsibility, when did he shift his faith and say, God, wow, but okay, I trust you. You've allowed me to be the father of Jesus. 
how about their families? You know, normally when you break the news about a uh, son or daughter coming, it's, hey, but this was a little different. <laughs> so the families had to embrace that faith and trust too, right? What about the shepherds? Have you ever been somewhere where it's just so dark and the sky is so bright with stars? And it's just got to be really, really, I, I was raised in an area where it's really, really black at night. And the stars came out. But can you imagine just the angels just appearing before you and saying, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, the Messiah is coming, and then go. We need to go, an action step for them. Can you imagine how that felt, the moment <clears throat> where the angels appeared and the sky just lit up? And the faith they had as they walked, I'm sure they didn't understand everything, but the faith as they walked forward to see baby Jesus. How about the wise guys? You know, a lot of journey and a lot of travel. And then Herod freaks out and wants to kill him. The faith to be part of that scenario and to bring gifts to Jesus. And I am 100% sure they didn't know the whole story. So in faith they came and they rode to be with Jesus. Have you ever thought about the innkeeper? Sometimes he gets a bad rap. <clears throat> but nowadays, someone comes to the hotel, it's full. You're not going to be like, oh, oh, it's full. I'm going to kick room seven out. Okay, seven year God. So, and it, nowadays, if this happened, you know, with everything going on, you think the innkeeper's going to say, well, the rooms are full, but um, we do have a barn. <laughs> Feel free to go have your baby in the barn. Okay? Now, obviously, Bethlehem's different. But still, the faith of the innkeeper to say, I don't get all this, but I can see something big's about to happen. I can see it in your eyes, Mary. I can see it in your eyes, Joseph. So let me go clean the barn up so you can prepare to have this baby. He had some faith because obviously he had some liability in making that decision even back then. The innkeeper's faith was a beautiful thing too. Folks, our faith changes everything. <clears throat> God works in and through our faith and faithfulness. Do we want to see God's power in our lives, in our homes, our communities, our country, our world? then faith is key. And taking action on that faith is key. And maybe we need to ask more questions. Maybe we need to ask God, what is it you want me to do? You know, what is this moment that I'm in? How can I be used? What steps can I take? Be more aggressive in saying, God, how and what can I do? And that's sort of something I started doing a long time ago in grocery stores or if I'm in a store, especially if I'm irritated, I say, God, what is going on around me that you can use me? How can you use me? What could I do to help somebody? And it causes me to be more talkative and ask people questions and a little harder with the mask on, but sometimes a little safer to excluding COVID, just the, the interaction of the moment. What is God asking us to do? Can we give all of our faith to God this year as a gift? Can we trust him more? Can we ask him more what he wants us to do? Or do we want to settle? Do we just want to trust in what we've always seen, how it's always been? You know, we all have our issues when things go wrong, right? My car broke this week, Sharon's car. And right away, I'm like, oh, i got to fix it. What do we do? You know, I start planning and getting it ready. we got to fix. But... Then I stop and just pray and say, God, in faith I come, help me to work through this, to find the right person to fix it, to do the right thing. Do we stop and pray first? I think we should. And you know, um, let's use the football example. A coach will come, you know, the players all gathered around, he'll be like, okay guys, I want you to just go out there and do mediocre, okay? Just, just settle, okay? Just do average, everybody. Let's go on three, one, two, three, average! Okay, that <laughs> never happens. God wants us to do better than average. He wants to use us. It's a cool feeling when God uses you and you don't expect it, right? That moment we're all saying like, wow, that was a God thing. I was not expecting that. What a beautiful thing that is. So I'm encouraging you today to take a step of faith and to pray in faith and ask God what he wants us to do and how he's going to do it. Because I would love to see him out and move. I would love to see God work in ways that I've never seen him work.
Because in my life, even as a pastor, I settle for average mediocrity, and I don't want to do that. There's a beautiful verse in Romans 10.9, and we'll wrap up with this. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the initial thing that we do, simple faith, we come and say, I believe. I believe. I confess my sin and I believe that you're Lord. I did that when I was in first grade. I heard this message at church. I, I got it. I came home. I said, Dad, I want to become a Christian. And they were over. They were excited. I got it. It was a simple act that came from a very, very complex history of Jesus dying for us, of Jesus being persecuted for us, and all the biblical history that came before it. A lot, complex, a lot of death, a lot of victories, a lot of acts of faith. But in that moment, I came simply just understanding that I was a sinner and needed God. And he saved me, he changed me, he rearranged me, even as a first grader. So I encourage you with that simple faith that we came, that we live in that faith and we grow in that faith. And we become more like Christ in that faith. I don't know what God has planned for our church, but I think he's growing us and pushing us and molding us to be more like him. What does God have planned in a Christian college? I was there once. You know, how is he moving? How is he working? What's my part? How is God going to use me? So today, let's again think about without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith without actions and works, dead. And with faith, we can move mountains. God can do so much more than we can imagine or think. So we ready to start again, try again today? Be stronger in our faith, move forward. We got this? Or can we be mediocre? No. <laughs> Thanks for nobody responding to that. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> oh, one last thing. This is, an old go- this is an old gospel song. I love it, though. It says, Jesus said it. I believe it. I believe it because he said it. And I know, yes, I know, it's true. One more time. Jesus said it. I believe it. I believe it because he said it. And I know, yes, I know, it's true. Let's pray.